I'm back at you with another episode of Wetland Plant Identification of the Pacific Northwest. So uh, this unit is going to focus on marsh plants. And um, marsh plants grow in really wet areas, usually permanently saturated conditions, standing water. So we're going to go out, um, we're going to actually visit two different sites. Um, right now I'm at Lake Terrell, which is sort of uh, west of Ferndale, near the refineries. And uh, we're going to canoe around in the lake here and hopefully find a bunch of good stuff. And then we'll go to the boardwalk at Tennant Lake and find anything that we didn't see um, here at Tennant Lake. So Tennant Lake is really accessible again if you're uh, trying to, if you're in the Bellingham area and you want to um, look at some of the plants that I'm covering, uh, you can go to Tennant Lake yourself. If you're not in the Bellingham area and you're looking for some ideas about uh, where you can go to see some of the same plants that I'm covering in the field trip, um, shoot me an email and I'll send you some recommendations. All right, so let's head on out. Scrape, scrape. Time to paddle. Can't pass up an opportunity to go canoeing and look at marsh plants. So Lake Terrell is really nice because um, it has a pretty rich, um, what's called the floating leaf community in a marsh. I guess I covered this in the lecture. So we can see kind of around me now, there's a whole bunch of leaves that are actually floating on the surface. Um, so this is the floating leaf community and we'll probably see some plants that are actually submerged as well. It's another community often a little bit beyond the floating leaf zone. And then uh, over on the side, obviously that's the emergent zone that rims the, rims the wetland, the marsh. The marsh community is defined by water. And um, marshes are often found on the edges of lakes because lakes obviously have a lot of water. And then sometimes they're found in slow moving creeks and ponds. Um, and the marsh is divided into three different communities. We have the emergent community, the floating leaf community, and the submerged leaf community. So uh, here at uh, Lake Terrell, we could see to the right, the emergent, my right, the emergent community where we have um, cattails, uh, there's some reed canary grass in there, um, sparganium. So basically, if you see cattails, you're probably in the emergent zone of a marsh. A very indicative species of the emergent zone in a marsh. Um, areas with deeper water, uh, so deep that the plants can't be rooted to the bottom and uh, rise up through the water and rise up above the water, um, we have plants that are attached to the bottom and they just rise to the surface and float on the surface. And that's the floating leaf zone. So uh, probably the most important floating leaf plant um, is the new far polycepalum, the um, yellow pond lily. And uh, this marsh actually has a really healthy layer of some other uh, floating leaf plants that I'll talk about in a second. And then maybe in amongst the floating leaf community and especially in a little bit deeper areas, um, we have the submerged leaf zone. Plants here um, don't really invest anything in rigid structure and they often don't have um, floating structures either. Um, they just hang out and uh, underneath the water column and they tend to have really finely dissected leaves because they need to do gas exchange in the water where there isn't a lot of oxygen so the more surface area they have the easier it is for them to do that gas exchange. So anyway that's a, a quick overview of the, the three basic zones in a marsh and um, we're going to be exploring the vegetation um, at this site, mainly from the floating leaf and the submerged leaf zones. And then I'll save a lot of the emergent plants for either Tennant Lake or our um, salt marsh um, unit, which is uh, coming up next. Okay, the first plant I already mentioned in my overview of the marsh, but first plant you're going to need to learn is the yellow pond lily, new far polycepalum. Now, um, this plant generally floats on the surface, at least in the spring when the water levels are high, but 
in late summer, you might see a few of the leaves, as we do here, um, poking up a little bit above the water level. The stems, look here, the stems do have a little bit of rigidity. And um, the stems are spongy on the inside. Uh, when I squeeze it, you can see the uh, water kind of squeezing out of those spongy pores. So spongy tissue is um, really common in marsh plants. And remember in the last unit I talked about, um, talked about how uh, water can be stressful to trees, um, especially because trees don't have a lot of uh, specialized adaptations for dealing with um, permanently saturated conditions. Well, marsh plants, they are full of these specialized adaptations. Um, and that spongy tissue is precisely one of those adaptations. It's called parenchymous tissue. And um, ox or gas and CO2 move really easily up and down uh, the stem in that parenchymous tissue. So photosynthesis is happening on the surface at the leaf and gas exchange is happening there. And then um, the plant can absorb um, oxygen and transmit it down through the stem. And as the uh, root and the underwater stem respires, which you know every all living things respire, uh, these plants can also photosynthesize, so they could do two things, whereas we humans can only do one. Um, but anyway, as they're respiring, they need oxygen to respire, and they get that through the parenchymous tissue. Another adaptation of um, these. Um, marsh plants is that they're often covered with slime. It's probably hard for you to see, but there's quite a bit of slime on this leaf, and that just helps water from, it's kind of like car wax, um, it helps water from soaking into the stem and filling up all those uh, pores, the parenchymous tissue. Um, and I think that's part of the reason that water sheds so easily from the top is they, the top Instead of having slime, actually, the top has more of like a waxy cuticle. But um, lives in water, but it has, you know, it maybe doesn't love water all the time. It has to have adaptations to deal with um, so much water. Okay, so more on identification of the yellow pond lily. Um, note how the uh, leaf is heart shaped. The stem kind of comes off from the top of where the heart kind of comes in, is indented. Um, and the flowers are uh, yellow. They will ripen um, into a, a pod here. We could see those are the sepals. The petals have fallen off and um, the seeds are maturing inside this capsule or pod. And um, they'll turn kind of a olive color or a kind of like an avocado color when um, the skin of an avocado, when they're fully ripe. So that's the new far polycepalum. Next, I'm gonna show you or teach you this um, Brasnia, Schreiberi, or water shield. Ah, the leaves of this are actually so slimy the stem is so slimy that I had a really hard time even gripping it so that I could, yeah, it just slips right out of my fingers so that I could show you the leaf shape. So I think the best feature for identifying the Brasnia is by the leaf shape. This is a shape called peltate by botanists because the petiole attaches to the center of the leaf blade. It doesn't go through it. It doesn't, the leaf blade isn't um, indented isn't indented like the um, new far was. Um, and we can see that the underside is purplish. So that's Brasnia schreiberi. Look at here is um, a leaf that is emerging from underwater and it has even more slime on it covered with boogery slime and the leaf will just unfurl once it reaches the surface. But at this stage it's actually underwater still.
like I sneezed. Here's a flower of the Brasnia schreiberi. See the um, sepals are all spread out right now. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see the um, this ring of stamens, the male portion of the flower, uh, are a darker red, and then this pink and white color in the middle, those are actually the, the stigma of the female flower, the pistil, which should be in the middle. All right, here's a merchant plant that looks um, very grass-like. It actually has parallel veins on the leaves, which is similar to a grass, but um, the flowers are very different from a grass. This is called sparganium. This one is sparganium immersum. And um, the, here we can see the, uh, the inflorescence has uh, several, or the flowering stem has several flower heads. Okay, and these are actually all female flowers. They'll turn into seeds, and these are the male flowers. Um, so these little white tips, let's get a closer look at this. These little white tips are the stigmatic surface. And here, the little yellow tips, those are the um, anthers which release the pollen. And, you know, ideally they're going to fall in a different flower, not the same, not a flower, a female flower from the same plant. Um, so here I have one that's more mature. And we can see that here the female flowers are not, have been pollinated and they've turned into seeds. And the male flowers, they're totally withered and they're going away. Um, so I think a good feature for identifying this is by these uh, female um, clusters of seeds. They look a little bit like a ball and chain, like a mace um, that you would swing in medieval times to hurt people. Um, and this plant actually is an emergent plant right now, but earlier in the spring, it spends a bit of time as a floating plant. So we can see over there a little bit how some of the leaves are still floating on the surface of the water. Um, a lot of emergent plants have what's called a floating leaf stage. And so we see that there. Um, here, this one, you can see the pollen poofing off from those male flowers, the stamens. Time for a submerged leaf plant. Some people are really intimidated by these, but I think they're a lot easier to look at if you put them in a tray of water, because then they go back to their natural habit. They just spread out. Now, uh, good identifying features for the Utricularia vulgaris, or bladder, common bladderwort, is um, these little pods. This plant is actually um, both photosynthetic, but it's also carnivorous. So these little um, pods are filled with air and they have the capability of opening them up really quickly and then closing them. And when they open them up, water rushes in and it carries an insect that triggers that mechanism inside the pod where the insect then is slowly digested and provides um, nitrogen for the plant. So here we have a somewhat carnivorous plant. Another submerged plant here is uh, Elodia canadensis. And the leaves are still small, but they're not so finely um, dissected as in the bladderwort. So the reason that uh, these submerged leaf plants have really fine leaves is so that they can absorb oxygen that's actually dissolved in the water. They need a lot of surface area to do that. And um, so having many, many fine leaves is more effective than having a few really broad leaves. So this one has, you know, just a pair. They're opposite there. Looks like a pair of opposite leaves there. Um, sometimes they'll actually have um, three coming out. Yeah, there's one that has one, two, three leaves. One, two, three leaves. 
Um, so they're either opposite or in whirls of three. I don't know that I've ever seen them in a whirl of four, but perhaps that can happen too. Because of all the marsh vegetation, sometimes it's pretty difficult to paddle a canoe through a marsh. So I'm using what's called a push pole, a tool I use when harvesting wild rice uh, to push the canoe through the, through the marsh. Push poles also work really well on rivers where it's too shallow to paddle sometimes, um, if they're shallow rivers. Really scaring up the fish as they go. It's only about two or three feet deep here. Okay, a floating leaf plant. I'm actually in um, pretty deep water here. Yeah, more than six feet deep. And um, this plant here is called Potamogeton natans, or uh, pondweed. And uh, a good feature is notice how the leaf just comes, the, the petiole attaches right to one end of the leaf. The leaf isn't chordate. It's actually just a oval shape, maybe what you would describe as ovate, meaning egg-shaped, which means that it's a little bit broader near the base than it is near the tip. Ovate is a very common leaf shape. Um, so Potamogeton natans, or pondweed, has alternate leaves um, and this long stem that um, is kind of doesn't have any rigidity. It just, um, you know, the seed germinates. And the stem grows up, 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 up until it gets to the surface, and then it floats these leaves that, or <laughs> sprouts these leaves that float on the top and do all the photosynthesis. So here's a look at some Potamogeton in amongst the Brasnea and the Nufar, and we could compare the leaves, but anyway, good look at the flower. Ah, the wind's blowing us. Go ahead and go back to it. Good look at the inflorescence. We can see it's a spike, which means that all the flowers are directly attached to a central stem. Okay, here is uh, Persicaria amphibia. This is um, a plant that floats on the on the water surface, and the leaves have a pretty uh, distinct white line that run down the center. There's another one. Um, but they, the petiole attaches just at the um, edge of the leaf. The leaf isn't um, chordate or anything like that. And uh, right now it's really easy to spot because of the pink um, spike of flowers. This plant is actually in the dock family. Um, the same family as rhubarb and uh, curly dock, which is a common garden weed. All right, and a good way to tell the dock family is that the nodes are always surrounded by a papery sheath. So I just rubbed off that papery sheath. So Persicaria amphibia. So this Persicaria amphibia uh, grows in more open water environments than a lot of the other persicarias, and I'm gonna show you another persicaria in a second. Um, so if you see one that's out really amongst the pond lilies more than it is along the um, margin of the marsh, then um, that's a good reason to suspect this uh, persicaria amphibia. Also, the cluster of flowers is really densely packed together, whereas most of the other persicarias have flowers that are kind of um, more spread out and you can actually see some stem in between each of the individual flowers. So those are good features for Persicaria amphibia. Now I'm gonna show you, uh, amphibia meaning water, right? Now I'm gonna show you another one, Persicaria hydropiperoides, which uh, 
hydro, you know, also means water. But anyway, this is one that grows more along the edges of wetlands or marshes. Okay, we're on the edge of the marsh. We could see the number of emergent plants here. And I came over to investigate another Persicaria species, which I think maybe is Hydropiperoides. Persicaria Hydropiperoides. Okay, so uh, it's growing all in here, thick carpet. Um, this is uh, not very deep water. Um, if I pull one out, I could see that it's ro uh, rooting readily at the nodes. Um, what other features do I see? Uh, some of the leaves have black dots on them. And um, the flowers, here's a good flower here. Um, they're kind of this white or pink color. And the inflorescences are long. The flowers are a bit spaced out. And the inflorescences are mainly terminal. OK, uh, there are some minute features that aren't going to show up on film. But um, the, um, the leaves, if I look really carefully, are covered with very fine hairs and th right here is called a um, where the leaf attaches so there's the leaf blade the petiole and then there's this sheath that I was talking about that is common among um, all the members of the dock family and on this particular plant it is also covered with hairs and it has these spiny teeth up at the tip all of the persicaria species have those um, teeth at the tip of that sheath um, okay, so I'm going to go through a couple different options that it could be, and then we'll talk about why it's Persicaria hydropiperoides. So this is uh, Sarah Cook's um, Out of Front book that's really great, um, Wetland Plants of Western Washington and Northwestern Oregon. And um, she provides good accounts of, per um, well, it used to be called polygonum, but the, now it's Persicaria hydropiper. Persicaria, Persicaria hydropiperoides, Persicaria laplathifolium, and um, Persicaria persicaria, <laughs> confusingly. Okay, so um, we can see here on this page that these two species have um, flowers that are mainly axial. They're also terminal, but they're mainly axial. All right. This one has those black dots on the leaf, so that would be um, a good candidate. It looks like this one also has hairs on that um, sheath. Um, but the fact that it has uh, all these axial flower clusters, I think, eliminates that option. Um, on this page, we see that Persicaria hydropiperoides only has those terminal flowers, and then um, Persicaria hydropiper has terminal flowers and a few axial flowers too. Um, the, now, if I dig into the descriptions, I'll see that um, hydropiperoides commonly roots at the nodes, which we saw. Look at all that nodal rooting. <laughs> okay, and, um, and it's just hairier in general. So the leaves are hairy and those, um, those bracts are hairy. And if you taste the leaf, uh, it'll have a kind of a peppery taste, uh, which is common among the species. So sometimes it's called pepperwort as a common name, or, or water pepper, I guess. <clears throat> All right, so that's great. We saw two different species. Um, they're both, uh, you know, the, the one that, out, that was out in the open water, the Persicaria amphibium, I think is really separate from all the rest, uh, but you'll have to look more carefully at all the, um, the inflorescence features, the hairiness, um, the root um, rooting at the nodes or not, and those types of features to uh, distinguish the other four species. Another really good marsh plant, I'm excited to see this one here, called Hyperus vulgaris, or mare's tail. Um, vulgaris just means common. Uh, anyway, it looks a lot like a horsetail, uh, which is maybe why it's called mare's tail. But this actually has 
um, flowers that are found at the base of each of the leaves along the side. And the leaves are flat, kind of distinctly two-sided, as opposed to the round or square leaves of a horsetail. This, um, this usually grows in kind of shallower sections of the marsh, but um, it emerges up out of the water, so it's uh, an emergent plant. Even though it's growing amongst some of the floating leaf plants here, there are a few other emergent plants close by. So, Hyperus vulgaris mare's tail. Right at the edge of this marsh is some Wapato, Sagittaria latifolia. This is one of my all-time favorite plants. Um, it, ha it produces a really delicious, starchy, edible tuber, um, and it's important for wildlife too. Um, ducks and geese will eat that tuber, as will muskrat and probably beavers too. Anyway, um, distinguishing features of this plant, right now we can see that the leaf is very arrow-shaped. So it's uh, triangular at the tip, but then it has these two lobes that stick out and down, um, like some arrowheads. So Sagittaria means arrow. Sagittarius, I think it was a hunter or something like that. Anyway, um, it's not flowering now, but another really good identification feature is that it has three petaled white flowers. And all of the members of the Alismataceae have three petaled flowers. All right, here is Ludwigia palustris, palustris meaning of the marsh. Um, this plant has opposite leaves and um, it has these stems that also sprout axially from the leaf nodes. Anyway, uh, grows in usually the shallower zones of marshes. It's an emergent plant and we could see how it's rooting adventitiously. This is exciting. Here is the flower of the Utricularia vulgaris. So you don't see those every day. It's a flower that only has bilateral symmetry, a little bit like a snapdragon. I'm at Tenet Lake now, and we're going to start off by comparing four different types of horsetails. Now, two of these aren't always found in wetlands, but two of them are uh, good marsh um, plants. So uh, I just thought it'd be a good opportunity to cover all four at once, and I think I can find all four here. At least I know I can find three of the four. So the first, I, the first one I want to cover is called um, Equicetum arvents. Now this is, uh, the common name is field horsetail. Arvents actually means field of the field. And um, here in this kind of old grassy area, there's some growing right along the edge of the trail. So this is the field horsetail. And some features that I think are pretty good for identifying field horsetail. Well, like all horsetails, it has um, has these nodes. I guess we talked about that uh, last time. Okay, so specific to this horsetail, we, we see that it has these um, branches uh, or leaves, I guess is what they are. Um, and the leaves are actually divided into these segments. So there's a short segment from there to there, another segment that's about an inch long from there to there. Um, and if you look really closely at the segment or try and roll it between your fingers, it sort of rolls the way that a triangle would roll. It doesn't roll very easily. And I'm gonna try and get some um, real close up shots and you could actually see how the, um, the stem, instead of just being like a triangle like that, it's kind of flared, like the way that a star has points that stick out. That's how the edge of the stem is, it's winged. That's what people would call a winged stem. Um, and that's a very distinctive feature for the field horsetail. The field horsetail has a, a vegetative shoot, which we have here, and it has a reproductive shoot that doesn't have any branches at all. It just has a, a shoot that grows up with a cone-like structure called a strobilis on the top. And I mention that because um, two of the horsetails have that pattern the field horsetail and the giant horsetail, Equicetum telmachia. 
Now, the other two horsetails, they are different. They have the, um, the reproductive structure is on the same structure with some of the leaves. Okay, one more thing, sort of a gestalt feature or a form feature. It's hard to put your finger on it, but um, you kind of get a sense for it from a distance, is that this horsetail has kind of a wiry look to it. All right, and the stem is quite thin. I never really see it thicker than about um, three-eighths of an inch, or this one is probably just a quarter inch. Now, the giant horsetail has a stem that's usually around a half inch in diameter. Okay, and even though it has the overall same form as the common horsetail, uh, the giant horsetail doesn't have that wiry look to it. Um, these, uh, these lateral uh, leaves, needle-like leaves, are a little straighter. They're not so kinked and wiry looking. So we looked at the common horsetail, and this is the giant horsetail. Giant horsetail is a lot bigger than common horsetail. And a few features that um, I think are sort of subtle, but once you tune into them are uh, good identifying features. If, uh, you know, sometimes you find a small giant horsetail looks a little bit like a big um, common horsetail, this is how you can tell them apart. So um, these are the needle-like leaves and where they attach, well, let, let's back up a bit. These, um, these branches or needle-like leaves they're actually divided up into segments, and each segment is about inch and a half long. But right at the base where they attach, coming a little closer, right at the base where they attach, we could see that it's just about a half inch long, the first segment. Now, um, it's with the common horsetail, um, Equicetum arvense, that first segment is a lot longer. So anyway, the reason that matters is that from a distance, you actually can see these rings um, what looks like an apparent ring uh, where all the first segments terminate. And actually, if you pull out one of these branches, usually that um, first segment stays. So now it'll be easier to see what I'm talking about. I've pulled out, oops, pulled out the top two. All right, so those are the first segments, a uh, few of them pulled off, but uh, most of them stayed and we can see that they're a lot shorter. Okay, other good features. Obviously it's just a fatter diameter, so we can see that this is close to half inch in diameter. I'd say they range between about three eighths and maybe five eighths of an inch. Um, so maybe about the diameter of a Sharpie. And um, again, like the common horsetail, the Equicetum arvents, the giant horsetail, Equicetum talmatia, uh, has a separate structure for the um, reproductive shoot and a separate um, plant for the uh, vegetative growth. So all the photosynthesis happens in this shoot here and the reproductive shoots, they've all withered away, um, but you see them in the early spring. Uh, they stick out of the ground, they have that strobilis on the top. So one last feature is this uh, needle-like leaf. The cross section is roughly round, more or less round, and so it's really easy to roll in my finger. Now, um, compared to the Equicetum uh, arvents, the cross section, remember I mentioned it has that kind of wing nature where the, um, it kind of pokes out like star points, and it doesn't roll as easily in the fingers. You could feel those, um, you could feel those wings kind of resisting the roll, rolling, whereas the Equicetum telmatia rolls very easily. Another horsetail is this here. This is called river horsetail or Equicetum fluviatile. Now the river horsetail um, sometimes has just a few side branches or almost none. Um, this one is intermediate, and here this one has quite a few, at least at the base, but we can see at the tip there aren't very many of those leaves. Um, but it's all the same species, that's just a variable trait, so get used to seeing um, some variability there. Uh, notice how these um, are kind of wispy looking. 
Okay, but the real feature for this river horsetail is the stem. It's very wimpy, and it's wimpy because it's totally hollow. So if I break it open and we look on the inside in there, it's totally hollow. So that hollow stem is uh, similar to the parenchymous tissue. It's even better at letting gas move up and down, although it's a little worse at providing um, structural rigidity for the plant. So anyway, that's an adaptation for transporting gases uh, down into the root zone of this uh, river horsetail. So I often see this one growing um, right out of water, um, but only usually six inches to a foot of water. And sometimes it's growing um, on dry land, especially later in the season. So uh, we're going to see another one that looks surprisingly close to this called the um, marsh horsetail, Equisetum palustra. I'll grab that one next. Here is the marsh horsetail, Equisetum palustra. Now um, notice how um, these branches or leaves are really uh, a little bit thicker. They're not so wispy compared to the river horsetail. All right, you see that they're, they're maybe two or three times the diameter. Now the stems themselves are about the same diameter, but then a really good difference is this stem is not completely hollow. We can see that it sort of looks like a honeycomb pattern on the inside. There are there's a hole in the middle and there's maybe five or so holes around the outside, uh, but they're all very small on the Equisetum palustra, whereas the river horsetail, the Equisetum fluviatile, totally hollow in the middle. So that's the best feature for telling them apart. If you don't want to rip them out of the ground, you could pinch them. This one feels very firm when you pinch it, whereas this one is totally wimpy when you pinch it. Okay, and there's some variability in the number of leaves. We could see that this one is kind of sparsely foliated, or at least they're fairly short, um, about the same, whereas this one, the, the leaves are quite long. And then also notice how this one doesn't have a reproductive structure on the top, just this long pointy tip. Uh, neither does this one, but this one here does have that uh, strobilis or cone that'll release spores. This reproduces with, by spores instead of by seeds. And um, so totally different life history strategy than most of our flowering plants. Here we have a fun little aquatic plant called Hydrocotyl ranunculoides, or marsh pennywort. Now the name Hydrocotyl ranunculoides, um, I guess ranunculoides means that the leaves look a little bit like a buttercup leaf and that they are um, kind of palmately lobed. Um, and hydro, you know, has something to do with water, a little something to do with water and caudal, like in cotyledon, um, coming from the seed embryo. Anyway, uh, this plant uh, floats on water and is a pretty um, great find, not one that I see in every marsh. So, happy to see it here. Here's a closer look at the hydrocotyl ranunculoides. Um, with a white background, you could more easily see these um, roots. Now this uh, just floats along in shallow water and um, usually the leaves will actually rise up above the water, but the, the stem is usually submerged. Okay, here is Ceratophyllum demersum, also called coontail. And uh, there are two good identifying features for this plant. Um, it has a whole bunch of leaves that arise in whorls along the um, submerged stem and the leaves actually fork. You can see that um, that one there, there are two branches on it. So that's one good feature is the forked leaves. And you know sometimes they will fork again um, so each branch might then have um, another fork in it. Another good feature is just the texture. If you feel this thing it has a really rough texture. It feels like, um, it's not so rough as sandpaper, but it feels like rubber that has a whole bunch of little nubs on it. Um, and it's actually even a little bit squishy. It's very rubbery. 
even though they're thin, they still have that herbery feel to it. So that's Ceratophyllum demersum, and it'll grow in amongst the, um, the nufar, the palm lilies, and with uh, milfoils and um, other um, submerged reef plants like uh, the Elodea. I have two species here. It, they look very, very similar, but I want you to focus in on the rootlets that are hanging down from the leaves. Okay, so this one here on the left just has one or two rootlets. And this is actually the smallest flowering plant in North America. It's called lemna or duckweed. And um, next to it is one that has a little bit bigger leaf and more of those rootlets coming out of the bottom. And this is called spiradella. Okay. Okay, here is a, an aquatic herbaceous plant called Biden's frondosa. Pretty sure, but we're going to key this out. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the great identifying features. Later in the year, it'll have yellow flowers. It's in the aster family, so there'll be these sunflower-like flowers with a whole bunch of um, uh, parts to them. They're actually a composite flower, so each little ray or disc in the middle of the flower is actually its own in the middle of the head is actually its own flower. But anyway, I'm gonna pull this out and we're gonna use the key in um, Hitchcock and Cronquist for Bidens to figure out um, if it actually is frondosa as I think it is. But um, so just a quick feature in the field at this stage, we can see that the, it has three leaflets. And I think that's all we really need. Most of the other Bidens um, do not have three leaflets. So let's pull out the key and see what we get. Okay, just a few other quick features before I dive into the key. Um, notice that the leaves are opposite. That's true of all the Bidens. Um, and this species has a lot of really fine roots. And these are actual, actually annual roots. They're, it doesn't have any fatter, thicker roots that um, would be indicative of a perennial species. Um, and I picked it, you know, in this really wet area. So growing basically out of um, water or semi-wet water with a little bit of land showing. Okay, so the first step in the key says, uh, the way this key works is I'm going to compare 1A to 1B, and then I'll choose whichever one matches best. And then I look under whatever matches best and in this case, if it was 1B, then I would compare 2A to 2B and so on until I run out of options and I get to an answer. So 1A says aquatic perennial submerged leaves filiform. Uh, well, I don't think it's a perennial, although it is, and it's not exactly aquatic, but submerged leaves filiform dissected. It doesn't actually have submerged leaves. All the leaves are um, above the water. So already I'm thinking that 1A probably isn't right. Uh, 1B, terrestrial or semi-aquatic annual, leaves not filiform dissected. So uh, filiform means uh, like filaments, um, which would be very linear, um, like a lot of the submerged leaf plants we've, we've seen in the past, um, just an adaptation for gas exchange uh, underwater. Okay, so I'm going to go with 1B because it's terrestrial or semi-aquatic annual and it doesn't have the filiform leaves. Um, so under 1B is 2A, leaves pinnately compound with three to five leaflets. The leaflets all are mostly slender petiolate, which means, um, you know, the, the stock, they have stalks on the, um, on the leaflets. Uh, lanceolate to lanceolate ovate, and then it says rays zero, which um, the rays are the uh, the strap-like or the flattened um, florets on the outside of a um, aster family flower because the flower of an aster is a head made up of a whole bunch of flowers or what looks like a flower is actually you know could be hundreds of flowers all compacted into one flower head it's an inflorescence 
Okay, so 2A says leaves pinnately compound, or 2B leaves simple or occasionally tripartite in numbers 4 and 5, but then lateral leaflets broadly decurrent to, uh, winged, to a winged petiole. Um, all right, well, this one has um, three leaflets, so I'm going to say, and it doesn't have a winged petiole. Um, so it seems to match uh, 2A pretty well. So now we're down to 3A versus 3B. Um, outer fillories 5 to 8, well, we don't have flowers, so we can't have fillories. Um, this coral is orange, also no flowers. Um, oh, here we go, leaflets, three, occasionally five. Then it says the habitat is wet, often disturbed um, places. Um, okay, so 3B, uh, again, starts with some flower features. And then it says leaflets, three to five, wet, often disturbed places as well. So it looks like the distinguishing feature is whether some of the plants have up to five leaflets or whether the most leaflets they have is three. And, um, you know, this plant doesn't have any with five leaflets. And um, looking around, none of the other plants here have any with um, five leaflets. So we can conclude that it is um, B frondosa. B just stands for the genus Bidens. So Bidens frondosa, we got it. Okay, another feature that I don't think was mentioned in the key uh, to the genus, but when you're um, a good feature for recognizing it in the field is that it has opposite leaves. So all the Bidens have opposite leaves. Now later in the year, uh, it will produce a flower. This one, when it's flowering, is a little bit distinct in that it only has the disc florets. It doesn't have any ray florets. Um, and then when it goes to seed, um, it has this type of seed that's called a stick tight. Um, it's designed to catch in the fur of animals and uh, it'll be carried someplace else and eventually fall out of the fur, hopefully land in, you know, the right type of habitat and sprout into a new plant. Um, and for this species, the Bidens frondosa, that stick tight only has two barbs on it, whereas some of the other Bidens have, you can see this one has two big ones and two small ones. Um, Biden Cernua, which I hope to see today, it actually has uh, four long barbs. So some tips to distinguish the different Bidens as well as just recognizing Bidens in general in the field. Beside me here is a plant called hard stem bulrush, Schenoplectus validus. I know that's a mouthful, but uh, there you have it. Uh, if you're using an old book, it might actually list it as Scirpus validus or even Scirpus lacustris, but you'll be quizzed on Schenoplectus validus. Now, uh, this plant has a pretty squishy stem, and um, inside it's really uh, spongy. And that's the parenchymous tissue that enables, you know, like many plants I've talked about before, it enables gases to um, travel down into the root zone where it's basically sub, um, submerged underwater all the time. Some other features, um, has a round stem, and this is actually a little bit confusing because I taught you that uh, sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses have joints all the way to the ground. But um, this is an exception. So a few bulrushes are, they're actually in the sedge family, the Cyperaceae, but a few of the bulrushes actually have round stems. Um, so this is one of those exceptions. Anyway, uh, we can see that it has um, a rather compact inflorescence. Uh, it has these spikelets that are on the end of these um, little stems called, well, we'll just call them stems for now. I want to overwhelm you with vocabulary until we get to our sedge unit. Um, and then it has this little thing that pokes out right at the base of the inflorescence. And this is called a bract. It's kind of like a leaf. Um, but otherwise, it is free of, of any leaves all the way up and down the stem. 
totally bare and round all the way to the ground. So um, that's a good feature for, for the, um, this bull rush. Um, and when we go into the salt marsh, we're gonna see a very closely related uh, species um, that actually looks almost identical, except the, the key distinguishing feature is looking at the cross section of the stem. Um, so this one is, uh, it's called hard stem because the stems are a little bit harder. They're a little bit harder to squish. And if I cut one in cross section, I'll do this again. Um, I cut it in cross section and we zoom in real good and count the number of uh, cells that are kind of across the diameter. We'll see that there are um, something like 15 or so cells across the diameter, whereas on the soft stem bull rush, it's like less than 10. So this one actually might have 20, whereas the soft stem has half as many. Um, and so I like teaching these gestalt features, I call gestalt features, um, things to recognize from a distance before you get real close and count the cells in a cross section. This, uh, from a distance, you could notice that the hard stem bulrush has stems that are very straight and they don't taper really fast. So at the base, they're at most about um, three quarters of an inch and uh, they all stick more or less straight up. Whereas when we get out into the salt marsh and start looking at the um, soft stem bulrush, we'll notice that the plants kind of lean to the side a little more, the stems um, taper more. So at the base, they're like over an inch in diameter uh, frequently, um, maybe even an inch and a half. And in general, this plant grows more in fresh marshes um, whereas, this isn't a hard fast rule, but um, the soft stem bull rust tends to grow more in salt marshes. Here we have a small plant called Cium suave, or water parsnip. Now this is in the carrot family, the APAC, and um, right now it doesn't look like much. Um, it likes growing out of water in the spring and um, as the water level drops um, during the summer, sometimes it'll find itself uh, on muddy land. And uh, this plant, like a lot of carrots, has a pinnately compound leaf. This is just one leaf. Um, and the, the leaf changes a bit um, throughout the year. So in the very early spring, the first leaves might actually grow in the water and they're finely dissected. And then um, later in the year, um, when it develops a upright stem, the leaves will um, lack that fine dissection and they'll just be um, a once pinnately compound leaf. Now, one of the best identifying features for this plant, here's another leaf over here, is looking at the petiole. And we can see that it has these circular constrictions on the petiole. Okay, that's a really good feature. And the leaflets, they're much longer than they are wide, and they are um, has these kind of sparse serrations. Now, one plant that some people um, sometimes confuse with this is one called Douglas water hemlock, Cicuta douglasii. We're going to we're going to cover it in a later unit. And um, I just point out these constrictions because that is a fail-safe way to distinguish it from the Douglas water hemlock. So I'm going to take you up on the other side of the trail. There's one that's flowering, and we'll look at some floral features. The flowering stem can actually get quite tall here. This one is probably about five feet above the water surface. Um, it's growing in amongst all this other stuff. Hopefully you can get a good look at it. Um, but this is in the carrot family, the APACE, and all the members of the carrot family have flowers that are born in umbels. And that means that they have, um, the flowers are on stalks that all attach back to one point. 
This one actually has a compound umbel in that each of these stems has another set of uh, stems that arise from it, all from one point. So um, white flowers, these have a little bit of a greenish yellow tinge to them when they're young, but they'll be more pure white um, as they get older. Here we can see this one is even greener. Every part of this plant is hairless. So the um, stem, it lacks hairs, the main stem, and the leaf petioles also lack hairs. So that's important to recognize for the carrot family in particular because, um, well, some of the most poisonous members of the carrot family lack hairs, and there are a few edible members of the carrot family that have hairs. And so if you're interested in wild edibles, I just advise a lot of caution if uh, you're trying to eat something from the carrot family that is hairless, because it could be Douglas water hemlock, which is one of the most deadly poisonous plants in North America. Here we have Comarum palustra, also called Potentilla palustra, if you're looking at an older text. And uh, this is in the rose family, um, which is a really big family. And it has leaves that are pinnately compound. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven leaflets on that one. This one just has five. Um, you might find one with nine, but I'd say five to seven leaflets is most common. And they're kind of a blue-green color on top with this um, whitish color on the bottom. Now it's really common for these plants to have sprawling stems. And this actually is a little bit drier habitat than we normally find it. Um, it'll grow right out on um, and float on the water surface, but usually it likes to have its roots be in an area that's a little bit drier. So if there are, um, if it can attach to the edge of water um, and, and kind of grow out into the water, then that's great for this plant. Okay, some floral features. Um, this plant uh, has these purple flowers. I think they're, if you look closely, they're really pretty, but from a distance, they're kind of drab. And um, right now we could see that the, um, the stamens are purple color and the pistils are kind of this yellow, um, yellow and black. Now these uh, have really prominent um, sepals and the sepals get bigger after they bloom and fold up and kind of protect the fruit. So here inside is the fruit. It looks like a strawberry fruit. It's a aggregate um, fruit. And um, strawberries are also in the rose family. Here's one that's even bigger. And the seeds just kind of break off from the, what's called a receptacle here. So that's Marsh cinquefoil, Potentilla palustra, or Cumarum palustra. Here we have Alisma triviali, and some of the older books might call it Alisma plantago aquatica. Now this plant specializes in growing in kind of the marsh transition zone. So it really likes uh, flooded soils in the spring and soils that dry out later in the summer uh, where the, the seeds will germinate on that um, drier soil. Now, um, this plant is in the same family as the Sagittaria latifolia that we saw earlier. The, um, it's the Alismataceae. And um, unlike the Sagittaria, which had those arrow-shaped leaves, this just has um, an ovate leaf on the end of a long petiole. Now, all of the leaves um, come down to one point, kind of grow in these clumps. So there's a plant, another plant, another plant. There's like four plants all clumped in here together, but each plant will have three or four leaves that come out of the ground together. And you might recall that the key feature for the Alismataceae is that they all have three petaled flowers. 
So here's the flower for this Elisma triviale, three petals. And they're quite small, um, probably only a third or a quarter of the size of the um, Sagittaria latifolia flowers, which are much bigger. But the inflorescence of this is very large and um, you know they're all not flowering at the same time. Some of these have already flowered, some haven't yet flowered. Probably most of them have not yet flowered. So it's capable of producing a lot of seeds um, and uh, it's growing right on the edge here. So perfect habitat. It's a little shadier than I usually see it. I often see it in a little bit more light, um, but always in areas that dry up seasonally. Here is Minianthes trifoliata, which I think is a cool plant. Now, um, trifoliata means three leaves. Well, in this case, actually, it's and or leaves in three, probably. <laughs> and so here we go. Looks kind of like a clover, <laughs> except they're much bigger. But their flowers are white and frilly and really pretty, and they're on a inflorescence that's about this long. I think it's a raceme, which means that. Each of the flowers has its own stalk, but they're all organized on um, a stem together. And uh, this plant sort of sprawls across the water surface. It has these um, long, thick rhizomes that um, we could see have all sorts of little rootlets um, and a very spongy stem. So. This would be another easy one to transplant. You could just throw this in a pond and it would grow. Minianthes trifoliata. The common name is bog buck bean. Don't know why. It does grow in bogs though. <laughs> Here is a kind of a tender herb called Veronica scutellata. Now, Veronica's um, always have opposite leaves. Ooh, this dappled light might be really hard. Uh, and here we see that these point out that dire direction. These are kind of 90 degrees from it. So kind of alternate directions, but they're opposite on the stem. And um, we can see that there are flower stems that are coming out axially from the leaf axils. The, um, the leaves are sessile, which means that they don't have any petiole. The petiole is just gone. The leaf blade attaches directly to the stalk. And then at those axils, we have the flowers. Now, um, if we could zoom in real close on the flower, there are some good floral features for distinguishing that, that are characteristic of all the Veronicas. So notice how two of the petals are bigger than the other two. Anyway, they have four petals. A lot of other plants have um, five. And um, it just has one, two, uh, yeah, one, two stamens and one pistil, which is common. Okay, and then down lower we have, um, I saw some seeds here. Yeah, there's some seeds, kind of a heart-shaped, um, Okay, so that's Veronica scutellata, loves growing out of water, also common in bogs. Um, and there's another species that I'm going to keep my eye out for that likes marshes even more than this Veronica scutellata, and that's Veronica americana. Um, but Veronica scutellata has long, narrow leaves, whereas Veronica americana is going to have um, fatter leaves that have a short petiole. We have our second species of Veronica here. Unfortunately, it's not in bloom, but this is Veronica Americana. And um, it still has opposite leaves, but these have a distinct blade and petiole. Usually the petioles are pretty short. Um, and the flowers are gonna look about the same as the, oh, here we go as the um, Veronica scutellata. So to compare the two, 
these leaves are very narrow and lack the petiole. These leaves are much wider and have a petiole. The margins of the Veronica americana are serrated. And it will have axial um, flowers that look very much like the Veronica scutellata flowers, which this is here. But yeah, so Veronica americana. Here we have Lysomachia thirsiflora, or tufted loose strife. And this plant is unmistakable when it's flowering. Um, it has these bright yellow flowers that often look like they're in um, balls. These are a little bit more elongated than I sometimes see them, perhaps because they're starting to fade. But you can see some of the flowers are done, but the ones at the tip are still um, blooming. So uh, Lysomachia, we actually have a few different Lysomachia species. This is the only one with the yellow flowers. Um, Lysomachias have opposite leaves. And this one has margins that are um, not serrated and has the flowers that are rising axially on these pretty long stalks. Usually about halfway up the stem is where the flowers stick out. I spotted a gallium here, G-A-L-I-U-M. Now this, right now, it's easy to spot because um, it has so many of these white flowers. And this is one we're gonna key out. So I'm gonna pick it and go to a bench so I can sit down a little out of the path here um, to work on it. I think that because the flowers are um, covering the plant so conspicuously that it's probably gallium palustra, but we're gonna have to take a look at some closer features to see if that's the case. Before I dive into the key, I wanna point out a couple features that are good for g galliums or bed straws. Um, so all of the bed straws have leaves that are in whorls, which means that you have more than two leaves that all arise from the same point. And usually a whorl has the stem that continues on past a leaf. So here's a whorl of four leaves there's another whorl of four leaves. The stem extends further up. Here's a whorl of, oh, another whorl of four leaves. Okay, that might uh, prove to be a useful trait. Um, and then a lot of the galliums or bed straws, you know, sometimes they're called cleavers too as a common name um, because they, they will stick to your clothing. This one doesn't, so that might be a good feature to pay attention to. All right, so let's get to the key now. The first step in the key asks if the plants are annual from a short taproot or if the plants are perennial from a creeping rhizome. And uh, so this is a longer rhizome. Um, it, on the water surface, it sort of follows the water surface um, like that and then the plant sticks up. So a pretty robust plant too. Here's a, another specimen. So. Sometimes the size can be indicative of what annual or perennial nature, but really it's the root that you want to look at. Perennials invest a lot more in their roots. Okay, so if I choose 1B, plants perennial, then I go down to 5A versus 5B. 5A reads, fruits covered with uncinate hairs, which means um, curved hairs. Um, or in number eight, the fruit sometimes merely muricate scabrous, which is kind of like warty, I think. 5B reads, fruits without uncinate hairs, either glabrous or with short curved upwards to long straight hairs. So we're gonna have to try and find some fruits, which may be difficult because they're flowering right now. So I found a flower cluster that has some fruits that are starting to develop and we're gonna to struggle to get this on camera, but a good trick for, if you don't have a hand lens or a microscope in the field, but you do have binoculars, you could turn them upside down. And when you look through them upside down, up close like this, it actually works as a makeshift hand lens. Works very well. So these fruits are completely smooth. No uncinate hairs. So we can ignore the first option, what was it, three? 
and um, maybe this five. Yeah, it's not five a. So five b fruit without uncinate hairs, either glabrous or with short, curved, upwards, long, straight hairs. Next, we go to 10. 10a reads plants, male, female, uh, male or female, male flowers with reduced ovaries and wanting styles, female flowers with young ovaries and fruits conspicuously pu pubescent with long spreading straight hairs. Okay, we know that it doesn't have long spreading straight hairs, so it can't be that one. 10b flowers, um, both male and female, so it has both stamens and pistils, it's saying. Fruits and young ovaries glabrous, um, which is the case. Okay, so we can go to 11. 11a reads fruits solitary, or few in a small, rather inconspicuous inflorescence. Um, or flowers, um, many in compound and much branched rather showy inflorescence which i which was a feature that i clued into right at, um, early on so very showy inflorescence many flowers in each of those um, clusters so now 12 we go to 12a leaves three nerved four in a whirl fruits short hairy hairs curved up to straight well i didn't see any hairs so it's probably not that, but let's take a look at the leaves. Okay, it said the leaves were in whirls of four. This one actually has five. Most of them are in four. Well, this one is five too. Um, so the veins on the leaf is what, what, what I'm studying. So I actually see one vein or one nerve on that leaf. So 12B leaves one nerved, um, four to eight in a whirl, fruits glabrous. Okay. So that's the case, definitely one nerved. I remember the fruits are glabrous and we have mostly four, but some with five um, leaves in a whirl. Okay, so 13A to 13B, 13A reads leaves generally four to six in a whirl, um, not cuspidate, so the leaves aren't cuspidate, which means it's the leaves that could be clinging to me. Um, stems glabrous or puberulent, which just means very finely haired, uh, usually a little bit stiff throughout. Or 13b leaves generally in whorls of six to eight cuspidate, so it, they do have those um, teeth or hooked hairs, stems glabrous or puberulent throughout. All right, so uh, I clearly am gonna choose that the leaves generally are four to six in a whorl because most of them have four with a few five um, and they're not cuspidate. So we are at Gallium palustri, palustra, which means um, bed straw of the marsh, I guess. Galliums are in the Rubaceae, which is the coffee family, interestingly enough. I've never tried brewing a coffee out of the gallium seeds. They're so teeny that it would probably be a very expensive cup of coffee. This is Carex stipata. And it is one of our most um, common sedges, I'd say. It likes growing in grassy areas, um, marsh edges. It, uh, it needs a little bit of dry land to um, grow out of, but it likes growing on hummocks in marshes. And it needs a lot of sunlight too. Anyway, some features of the Carex stipata. Here I got um, three inflorescences here. Um, we can see that all the uh, perigenia, which are, is the name for the, the seeds of a sedge, they're all in the, the spikelets, are very short and everything is packed together in these um, clusters right at the tip of the plant. So each spikelet is sessile and is touching the one above it. And then we have these um, bracts, which are leaf-like structures that usually occur right at the base of the um, inflorescence. So that one has one long one, one short one. This one has uh, two bracts as well. Um, so they vary in length, but they always have those uh, bracts. And then another good feature is the culm is very angular. It, um, it's more than a triangle. So it has these winged points that stick out uh, or um, 
kind of a wing nature on each of the corners. So we'll get a close up of the comb. Sorry. On this side of the trail, we get a good view of its uh, kind of gestalt, its form, its habit. Uh, it likes to grow in these tussocks. So this is all one plant here. Um, and we could see that it has several leaves and several flower heads all growing out of this tussock uh, or hummock, sometimes they're called. And um, that's that, that nature of all the um, plants arising from one point is something that botanists describe as cespitose versus rhizomatous. So some other sedges will um, just send up one flowering stem from the rhizome here, and then another flowering stem from the rhizome there. And so you just see these long um, lines of plants, or if they're everywhere, then it just is a, a mat of um, one plant. Usually rhizomatous plants can form big um, expanses of uh, one species, whereas cespitose, cespitose plants, you see a clump here and a clump there, and usually there's some patchiness in between the clumps. Rushes can be cespitose too, and here's one that is called path rush because it often grows along paths. And uh, it's round like it should be. Now the, the real distinctive feature about this path rush is all these bracts that it has underneath the um, inflorescence. So it's got one, two, and two more little ones. So four bracts that all arise from just underneath these, um, these flowering stems, the inflorescence. There actually might even be a fifth in there. So this is Juncus tenuous. Um, slender rush is another name for it. It does have a very slender uh, appearance from a distance. Um, so I'd say it's probably our second most common rush. Um, I think I mentioned the first most common rush, common rush, Juncus effusus. I think I've taught you that one already, but, but we can see that this one only has one bract and that bract are, um, continues on up the stem. So it looks like, well actually some people just say that the inflorescence is coming from laterally on the stem as opposed to this one, the inflorescence is terminal, and then it has these bracts that um, stick out on the sides. So common rush, Juncus diffusus, and path rush or slender rush, Juncus tenuous. We were able to find all the plants on the study list except for Biden's Cernua, and you're still going to be on the hook for that one. Um, so rather than describe it, which would be meaningless, um, <laughs> I'm going to have you just look for photos and descriptions on your own. I want to leave you with a closing thought about wetland, the study of wetland plants. Um, summer is a great time for studying wetland plants because uh, they bloom a little bit later than most other plants. Most other plants are going to be blooming in the spring, at least at lower elevations. But there's so much water in a wetland and the plants have to um, push through that water to grow up above it, um, most plants, so that they can flower in an area and be pollinated by insects in an area that isn't so wet. And uh, so it takes a little bit of time for them to push up through the water. And also the water, um, water holds a lot of heat and that means it takes longer for the uh, water to warm up than it would for the soil to warm up in a terrestrial environment. That pushes everything back a little bit later. Uh, seeds aren't going to germinate underneath the water um, when it's cold. They wait for it to get a little bit warmer. Um, so anyway, that's good for us because this is a summer class and um, things are blooming right now. Most of the things that we've seen have been in bloom. And some actually ha aren't even in bloom. And that's probably part of the reason that I wasn't able to find the Bidens, Cernua, was because um, it's hard to spot without the flowers. All right, so that's it for this week, and I'll catch you next time.